Hi everyone, my name is Jake. Um, in this video, we are going to talk about reactivity states amongst different functional groups. We are going to talk about examples of that using ATP reactions and the structure of ATP. And towards the end of the video, we are going to talk about uh, the macronutrients of the body and how um, these macronutrients are cut up into pieces that are we're able to use for energy. Okay. Hopefully you find this video helpful. And um, I wouldn't make a video that I feel like it just contains a bunch of fluff information. So pay attention closely and know this stuff very well. If you are watching this video, you should have already watched the video I made on saponification. Okay. So if you haven't, please go watch the bonification and then rejoin this video. Okay. So to speed it up, I've kind of drawn everything already. So let's make sense of this, okay? So we have broken down a lot of common uh, molecules that we see in our body into four different categories, okay? And let me explain these categories for a second, okay? We are talking about energetics. Sorry. AKA um, reactivity. How, how reactive something is, okay? And this has to do with the fact that a carbonyl or a phosphoryl is very is fairly polarized okay as in a, as in this oxygen up here is sucking electron density because we have four electrons in there is sucking that electron density up to it Okay, so if we were to do, and this is just a, a ketone, right? But it, I'm representing it to represent all of our phosphorils. And this, this ketone doesn't have resonance in it. But if we look at an ester here, do resonance on that, we'll see that it induces a full positive charge and a full negative charge, which is very unstable. Okay. In class, he should have gone over something called the giving and greedy oxygen. This oxygen up here is the greedy oxygen, the oxygen that is sucking electron density towards it, making it unstable. And then the same thing here, it, leaving this carbon and anything over here and over here, a deficit of electrons. Okay. That's what induces reactivity within molecules. Okay. So let's look at these guys here. These are in reactivity level one, one being the highest, very reactive, okay? We'll look at this guy first, okay? This oxygen is stealing electron density to it, and there is no giving lone pairs that can do resonance that can help it out. So very reactive. This is a ketone. Same thing here. This uh, greedy oxygen is sucking electron density up to it, inducing a form formal charge on it. Not stable. There's no resonance to stabilize it, okay? Um, we'll look at this guy here. So there is resonance of, th this is called an anhydride, okay? I'll call that. This is actually a... Uh, yeah, this is just your regular anhydride. Anhydride. Hopefully I spelled that right. Okay. And that is a molecule that has two resonance forms, actually. Okay. We could have done resonance this way, or we could have done resonance this way. But in that of itself, the fact that this individual oxygen is trying to satisfy both of these makes it very reactive. Dr. Savage in class usually tells a funny story. If he hasn't already, 
about how one Provo guy can't be dating two girls at once because he is unable to give both of them the amount of time they both deserve. So both of these oxygens, these greedy oxygens, are desiring help from these lone pairs. He can't give it to both at one time. Okay. Same thing happens here. These lone pairs here can't go this way and this way for resonance. This is called a mixed anhydride. Mixed anhydride. Um, where we have an ester and a phosphate ester being satisfied by one giving oxygen. Here's an interesting one. This is a thiol ester, okay? And thiol esters, oh, so here, and uh, they do have resonance, right? Like, as we've learned before, they have a resonance pattern that we get no. Yes, this resonance will take place, but it is very unlikely that it will do any sort of help because if you look at the periodic table, I wish I probably would have put one in here, but sulfur is lower on the periodic table, meaning that its electrons are further away from the nucleus while the carbon and oxygen are very close by. So sulfurs are all the way out here. That means that when these orbitals try to overlap to make a bond, they are not within proximity to do so. So although there is a giving sulfur, quote unquote, giving sulfur, like similar to the, ox the giving oxygen to help out this greedy one here, it cannot do so. Not, let's say 99% of the time it will not do so because of something called POO, poor orbital overlap. Okay, if that doesn't make sense to you, all you need to know is that a thiol ester has, I should have done that better, thiol ester has poor orbital overlap. Okay, and then here we have another phosphate and hydride. Okay. Next, we at our energy level two, we have our esters. So we have a regular ester here on the left and a phosphate ester here. I drew their resonance forms. As we have learned before, this resonance form, although useful in showing that these electrons here will help, will help out via resonance, that greedy oxygen, they are less likely to do it than later groups because it puts a positive charge on an electronegative element. Okay, that's why an ester sits at number two. And that's the same reason here because we put a positive charge on that oxygen via this resonance form. Okay, so esters and phosphate esters are number two. Number three, we have amides. Okay, this is very easy to remember because it's just an amide. The reason why we put amides lower than um, an ester is because when we show the resonance form here, it puts a positive charge on nitrogen, which is more okay at having it than oxygen. Okay. And then at full, uh, or sorry, at level four, the most stable, we have carboxylates and phosphates. And what you need to remember here is that this is fully resonance stabilized. This negative charge can be in two places without inducing a positive charge anywhere. And the same thing, this negative charge can be in two places. Okay, quick note about phosphates. So we see a phosphate up here. We see one over here. And you might ask why I'm drawing the OH groups on these. And I didn't, I only drew one here. And it's because it can be two negative or one negative in physiological conditions. You can choose, okay? So hopefully that gives you an overview. So a quick review, high energy, very reactive. We have this, these groups up here, these guys up here. So anhydrides, mixed anhydrides, 
thiol esters, phosphate esters, aldehydes, and ketones. Next, we have esters and phosphate esters. And another one I included over here is carboxylic acids. They behave very similar to an ester. Generally, we don't see these as much because we're talking about stuff within the body. So it'll generally be a carboxylate down here deprotonated, but we'll include it just for, to be thorough. Okay. And then next we have amides. And then we have so amides. And then we have our carbox salates and phosphates okay okay now that we have that we can look at atp so atp which is adenosine triphosphate is um and we just drew part of it here we cut it off here because uh this other part which we'll learn later in the semester and we'll have you memorize actually is important but not necessarily important with a lot of the reactions we do the reaction is usually take place over here Okay, so if we go through this molecule and we identify the reactivity states, we can see that we have a phosphate anhydride, which is a level one. We have another phosphate anhydride, which is a level one. And then we have a phosphate ester. You might look over here and be like, well, this is a level four. Um, but we see here we have a one, one, and a two. So that four is almost, uh, is, is just not important. We have very reactive molecules here. We're going to look at two examples. This is example one. Okay. So um, we have, and, and you might be like, well, why, why am I drawing these random molecules? And this is, these are just examples that Dr. Savage showed in class that illustrate a point. Okay. Um, we have ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate. So we had adenosine triphosphate, which is tri meaning three phosphate groups. And we have adenosine diphosphate, which means two. And this mi this mixed anhydride here, just two random molecules, okay? This reaction, this A ADP is going to attack that phosphate, and these electrons are going to hop up onto that oxygen. If we look at this system as we started as the reactants, we will notice that um, we have a 1 over here, a 1 here, and a 2 here just like we had in ATP, a one, one, and a two. After the reaction takes place, this is my, these are my products. We have a carboxylate and ATP, okay? This reaction is reversible because we went from a one one, two, to a one, one, two. And you might have asked, well, this is a four over here. We didn't have a four in the first. We, I mean, we technically did. We have something over here, something over here. So remember, we're looking at the high energetics here, okay? So what does reversibility mean? It means that we can freely move back and fourth between reactants and products without a loss or gain in energy. That is what the re reversible arrow means. It means that we can move back and forth. It can be the reactants. One second later, it'll go to the products. Next, it can go back and then it'll go back and then go back. Um, it's just, it's, it'll go back and forth because there's no energetic stopping it, okay? Because it can. Next is example two. Okay, this is what the setup is. Again, it's just a random example of a reaction. We have a base enzyme, we have water, and then we have ATP. Okay. What happens is, is this base enzyme, is it'll act as a base and steal off this hydrogen these electrons will hop up onto this oxygen. These electrons will go to that phosphate and these electrons will hop up onto this oxygen. And these are our products, this guy and this guy. So we get ADP and just a phosphate group. 
Okay. What happens here is that we start with a one, one, and a two, because ATP, we go back up to the top here. We start with a one, one, and two. And then we go to a one, two, and fours. Well, there's no other one in here like we had before. We had two ones, and now we don't have, we only have one one. Therefore, we went from high energy to low energy. Okay? For this reason, when we hydrolyze ATP into these products, it is an irreversible reaction because it would require energy to go back up. Okay. So this takes us back here. We can freely move a, within an energy group back. Oops, I don't know why it's doing that. Back and forth within a level one. We can go freely between one, between two, or within three, or within four. Okay. And we can freely move down. That's okay. So within a group and down. But in order to go gain energy, we need to add energy into it, which is kind of a black box that we will we'll get to later in the semester. So don't worry about this right now. But all you need to know is that we can move within an energy level or down energy levels but we can't move up without putting in energy, okay? So we go back here. We did hydrolysis on ATP. We got ADP and phosphate. And we realized that we went from a one, we went from a one, one to just a single one. Therefore we lost energy. So it's an irreversible reaction because we go from high energy to low energy. Or you could say the other side of the argument is that it would require us to go from low end, from low energy to high energy. It would require us to put energy in. Okay. Okay. Hopefully, so he showed those two examples in class. You might have got confused. These examples are just I would remember these. I'd be able to do them, but I would also be able to explain energetically why they're different. As we look here, we went from a one, one, and two to a one, one, and two. We can freely move back and forth. That's why it's a reversible arrow. It's a one-way arrow here because we went from a one, one, two to a one, two, four. Okay. There's a little asterisk here. This is just an asterisk in your notes. A one-way arrow does not mean, and I, I guess I forgot to include the name, the name of going from high energy to low energy is a thermodynamic sink. And just because you see a one-way arrow does not necessarily mean it's a thermodynamic sink. It means it's irreversible, but it, 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 but it can mean it's a thermodynamic sink. In order for you to determine it's a thermodynamic sink, you need to look at the energetics, okay? Okay, lastly in this video, we are going to talk about our macronutrients, okay? We'll go through this quick. Our three macros, macronutrients in the body are carbohydrates or sugars, fat, and protein. If you look on the back of um, any food label, it'll give you a ton of ingredients and what's in it and salt, and but where the calories come from, it comes from carbohydrates, fat, and protein because carbohydrates are, or sorry, because calories are energy and um, these are the energetic energy containing molecules. Okay. So what do you need to know from this part of the lecture and part of my video? Well, you need to know that the three major nutrients and I drew a carbohydrate like this. Okay. You'll, you'll, we're getting to that in class. Okay. But these major nutrients come in big packages. You're not just in eating an individual sugar. You're eating a long chain of carbohydrates. You're not just eating a, a, a tiny fatty acid. You're eating a triglyceride. You're not eating an individual amino acid. You're eating a long 
protein chain. Okay. So this is a disaccharide. We'll get to this later in another lecture, but this is the disaccharide. And this disaccharide is, is um, something you would take into your body and eat. And in order to cut it into its individual pieces, and that's the way our body needs energy, we need to use an enzyme called glycosidase. Okay, this is a glycosidic linkage connecting two sugars. And the enzyme that cuts it is a glycosidase. Okay. At this, you should have had, you should have watched my hydrolysis video. This will cover this very shortly, but or very quickly. This is a triglyceride. This is how you would eat. If you eat a Snickers bar, this is how the fat would come into your body. Okay, as a triglyceride. As you notice here, they are made of esters. And what we know about esters is we can hydrolyze them. When we do hydrolyze them, we get a glycerin backbone and three of these fatty acids. And these are the molecules. And I guess I didn't draw, like if we were to hydrolyze this, we'd get, this is a very poor drawing, but we'd get an individual sugar molecule. Uh, one carb here and we can use that to get energy here we get one or three of them but now they're individual and our body can use that as a one individual fatty acid to go produce energy from and then lastly we have proteins and generally these proteins are very long repeating chains of these i just drew one amino acid connected with another amino acid if you look here there they have a amide bond Okay, if you haven't talked about it yet, you will. But amid bonds undergo hydrolysis that has an identical characteristics to saponification. Okay, so just as an ester is hydrolyzed, we can hydrolyze an amid. And the products of amid hydrolysis carboxylate, just like we see in hydrolysis in the hydrolysis of an ester. But over here in esters, we see alcohols. But in this case, it is a nitrogen containing group because of this guy. And we know that as an ammonium. Okay, long story short, our protein will be cut up into individual amino acids. And these amino acids can go into our body for energy. Okay, and the enzyme that cuts them up is protease. So proteases cut proteins, lipases cut lipids or fats, and glycosidases cut carbs. Okay, so we'll quickly review that. We have three macronutrients, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. These come in big chain molecules. In order for our body to get energy from them, we need to cut them up into their individual pieces. So... We cut long carbohydrates up with glycosidases into individual sugars. We cut big triglycerides into individual fatty acids with lipases. Again, that's, sim that's the same as saponification. Watch my video on that. And then we cut proteins. And this would repeat. We cut an amide bond into individual amino acids with an enzyme called protease. Okay, I hope this video was helpful. Um, please watch my video before on saponification and the video after we'll talk about enzymes.